In the first episode of Grain, David Anderson Sr., an immigrant from Ireland, makes his mark in the milling industry. In the depths of the Depression, Dave's son Harold leaves the security of the National Biscuit Company to venture out on his own. Personal tragedies, a world war, and two business failures are just a few of the challenges he faces before the Anderson Elevator Company sees success in 1947. Explore new worlds and new ideas through programs like this, made available for everyone through contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. By 1949, the company was able to give back to the community that had stood by the family through all the tough times and the Anderson Foundation was established. The next year, grain storage was doubled with a second concrete structure. At the same time, the partnership began to increase in size. John's three sons, Dave, Mike, and Jeff, joined the family business as the first representatives of the third generation. By 1952, many farmers from the tri-state area were hauling their grain to the Andersons. Once they got paid, they'd turn around and go home. That's when a new idea was born. We had people coming from quite a long distance with a truck. The truck was empty. They had a nice big fat check in their hands, and they had all kinds of needs back home. Feed, seed, fertilizer, and all kinds of hardware and other supplies, and we built a store there. What we offer began to change a lot from feed, seed, and fertilizer to household goods. And, and then December, oh my gosh, we got to sell them millions of dollars worth of toys there. So we just experimented with a lot of things and had a lot of fun with it. It was considered the biggest monolithic concrete pour in Ohio history, and it garnered so much press that Harold Anderson needed to hire a freelance publicity coordinator to deal with all the requests for interviews. The big pour was big news. By 1953, grain storage again needed to be doubled. Once more, the family embarked upon a construction project, the likes of which was, in a word, remarkable. The plan was for 20 new silos that would connect with each other, somewhat like a honeycomb, and tower 168 feet into the air. To build such a structure required a constant pour of concrete for 11 straight days, non-stop, rain or shine. It wasn't the type of project to do every day, so naturally there didn't exist a trained workforce to take on the gigantic task. <laughs> that didn't stop Harold. As in the past, he depended on the grit and gumption of his family, his employees, local farmers, and a bunch of college boys. The bigger and stronger, the better. Each family member contributed significantly to the latest project. John, the oldest, was put in charge of personnel. Tom, who headed up all the building for the company, was in charge of construction on the new elevator. Bob, an honors student with a degree in civil engineering, drew up most of the building plans. Don designed much of the equipment that was to be used for the new elevator, and Dick installed that equipment while working a number of key positions on the pour. But they couldn't have done it without their dedicated crew. We had a good crew that was there that built that whole thing and had learned it inside and out. Jim Durst was on that job, Sam Ehrman, of course. There was a lot of knowledge there, and the right kind of attitude. John had no problem getting the crew. He placed help wanted ads on college campuses in Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana. He was looking for 225 big husky athletes who were willing to work 12-hour shifts for 11 straight days. The pay would be 237 plus room and board. But the benefits package may have been what attracted over 800 applicants, some students from as far away as Kenya, China, and Pakistan. Claire Dunn, head football coach for Toledo University, was hired on as the athletics and entertainment coordinator. One of his first assignments was to set up two basketball courts in case the boys wanted to shoot some hoops in their spare time. The courts were located not far from two of Harold's cattle barns. 
Once cleaned and sanitized, these barns were converted into giant dormitories, complete with shower stalls and toilets. Half the crew would sleep at night, the other half during the day. So while one group was resting up for the next shift, his counterpart kept the silos moving skyward inch by inch. The hole was uh, 25 feet deep, five foot slab on that, a lot of steel in that slab, and then thousands of cubic yards and tons of concrete going in there. And then on that, then we built the forms. Uh, and the forms were four feet high, shaped just like all those silos, just like you see today. And it's very ingenious, and they have to be done right. The deck, which contained the 20 forms, was about an acre in size. Uh, to support the deck, there were steel beams that supported the deck. And when you got to the top, those beams became the beams for the concrete floor on the top. I was asked to, to be the, the foreman for the steel crew on the night shift. That was 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. We jokingly referred to that as a half day. So I had about 24 men, as I recall. Their job was to run the steel into the concrete forms. We were pouring the 168-foot elevator with four feet of forms. So that meant every four hours, fresh concrete was coming out the bottom of the form. That's why they called it monolithic. You daresn't stop once you start. You had a buggy crew, a spud crew, a steel crew, and a jack crew up there, and some utility guys, you know. As the deck rose, so did the work crew, the equipment, and the next few inches that would become the walls of the silo. Uh, constant food there. You could get a hamburger anytime you wanted. Uh, fresh fruit, and, um, candy, you know, all for free. Just come and get it. Uh, there was a flush toilet up there. Now there's a trick. It certainly was a trick, considering the entire deck was moving skyward two inches every ten minutes. And it was imperative that the cement walls remain level. There was a system, a water system, that went to every jack and it was nothing more than a rubber tube that emanated from a tank in the very middle of all of that. And if you'd raise that tank up, the water level would go up at every jack. There was a, there was a glass tube hooked to that hose and a mark on there, which was the level mark. As the deck rose, the, uh, it would take another course of horizontal steel and uh, the, uh, the signal to, to, to be ready to raise the, the forms was a whistle and the master jack would be jacked up which would throw all of the, the water leveling systems out of kilter until the jacks were raised up so that everything was in balance, just like a level that you use for construction. And you had to make sure you didn't have any bubbles in that because that would really screw things up. Under the training and supervision of the Anderson boys, these novices performed like a well-oiled machine. But it wasn't just the Anderson sons who contributed to the poor. Harold's daughter Carol and her friend Fran Heilman worked the kitchen crew. When asked what they remember most about those days, they're quick to answer. Lots of boys and lots of laughing. <laughs> Harold's older brother, Dave, had experience in feeding large crowds, so he was put in charge of all meals and snacks. We gave them bacon, eggs, sausage, toast. They could eat all they wanted. They could come back, they ate as much, and they were hungry, very hungry. And lots of milk. They really yep. did drink a lot of milk, I remember that. Uncle Dave then would send us down to Toledo to pick up all of the fresh things. And we didn't have to pick anything out. It was already waiting for us. Well, and to order that much food, you didn't go to the local grocery store. It was all wholesale and in large quantities. And we, would, we went every morning, didn't we, mm -hmm. to get them things were fresh every day. Yeah, after we were finished <laughs> with feeding, that was part of our, our job. And by that time, we were pretty giddy. <laughs> <laughs> With 225 college boys around, it's no wonder the girls got giddy. <laughs> I was engaged to Dick at that time, and so I had to be a good girl. <laughs>
but Carol, I think, had her eye I, on I had, I had a crush. <laughs> I don't even remember his name. <laughs> we, we, I can remember sitting on our screened-in porch talking to him late into the night and thinking, oh, I have to be up at 5 in the morning. I don't think I liked him well enough to stay <laughs> up that late. <laughs> One would think that after a 12-hour shift, there wouldn't be any energy left for play. Not so with this crew. Coach Dunn put together so many activities that the 11-day stint seemed at times more like a summer camp than a temporary job. There was something going on all the time. Most of us slept some, but not much. We had all kinds of activities going on that were tempting to take part in. And remember, we were all young at that time. It'd kill us today, but we were all young at that time. So we welcomed uh, that opportunity. Since so many of the men were actually on college teams, football practice started early in 1953. But swimming in the big pool on the farm was everybody's favorite pastime. On the day Life magazine came to do its big story, they needed some girls to splash around with the guys. And of course, I was scared to death because I don't know how to swim. I didn't know how to swim, and I still don't know how to swim. <laughs> so they had a raft, yeah, yeah. a floating raft, and they put me on the raft. And But Carol was there, too, so we both had what we say our fannies made Life magazine because we were floating on the raft. Oh, dear. Yeah. <laughs> Not recognizable by most. Uh. <laughs> And as the concrete structure began to loom on the horizon, the atmosphere, especially at night, took on a carnival-like atmosphere. There were scads of people. When you went out there where the Anderson store is today is where the parking pretty much was, and there were just cars everywhere, and there were lights all over the place. It was well, it was just lights everywhere. There were vendors there selling popcorn, and. The thing that impressed me the most was how everything would, just little by little, you could hear the noise as the jacks were raising the concrete forms as they were going up and up. And I could, ne I could never understand how, when they poured the concrete, why it didn't fall out after they poured it in. It sounds relatively stupid to think that watching concrete was a big thing, but it was. It was an exciting thing, the noise, the atmosphere, the lights. We went to this about three or four times, and we didn't just do it once. We didn't have TV at the time, and so this uh, pour was entertainment for us. The live event became the biggest show in town, and everybody was watching, including the unions. Because we were doing this um, and uh, with our own crews uh, and, and not using union help or union contractor, uh, there was there was plenty of heat around that. Just before construction started, the Building Trades Council threatened to call a work holiday, meaning they would pull every one of its members off any construction job in the city to pick at the non-union project going on at the Andersons. Harold, undaunted, moved ahead with his project. And we just quietly went about our business. And then whatever happened, then we'd deal with that and uh, all the time explaining why our system was appealing to our people. So what our people thought was everything to us. Always a believer that the pen is mightier than the sword, Harold did explain to his people and the community his position concerning the union threats. He did this with full-page newspaper Though the ads. articles that appeared in Toledo newspapers about our family have been quite complimentary and naturally are appreciated. They put labor leadership in an unfortunate position. In the operation of our business, dealing largely with farmers, union procedure would work at a great handicap. We believe men live by the year and not by the hour. When a man starts to work for us, we make a practice of telling him that he may be handling grain one day doing construction work another, and maybe shoveling manure the next. The result is, he learns many things. Uh, we never had our people say, you're unfair, ever, you know, throughout all this stuff, when, when they were trying to get cards signed and everything else. They just liked the way we went about it. That doesn't say you didn't have people who had complaints. 
you always have that, and you have to deal with that in the right way, too. Uh, open door policies and listening and fixing it when you're wrong and admitting it when you're wrong. All those things are so important in any organization, but particularly when, you're, when you have an organized force outside trying to tell you how to do things. By day four, no picketing had occurred in spite of continued threats and the union's move to put the company on its unfair list. Out of respect and concern for business owners throughout the area, many who ran union shops, Harold did want to settle the matter peacefully. He agreed to hire a contractor that employed members of the Building Trades Council. This would be done for an upcoming project, the River Elevator Terminal. The big pour went on as scheduled with only two half-hour interruptions to repair machinery. There were no serious injuries unless you count sunburn. On one of the hottest days of the project, Harold put in a rush order for more suntan lotion. The six quarts he had previously purchased weren't quite enough. A Toledo Blade editorial written near the end of the project summed up the event quite eloquently. Everybody who knows him will tell you that Harold Anderson can be a cantankerous yet rugged individual. He does things by his own methods and in his own way. But anybody who watched the big poor can't help but take his hat off to him, his sons, and the whole crew. All of us have marveled at the way those masters of precision can unload and set up a huge circus so quickly. But this was more like constructing a great pyramid according to a timetable in exactly 11 days. The 1950s was a decade filled with new and innovative services for the grain industry, and the Andersons was at the forefront of providing those services. The speed at which a farmer could get his grain tested and unloaded kept increasing as more truck dumps were added. Automated controls allowed for quick and precise distribution of the different grains to storage silos or hopper cars. Many of these inventions were designed by Bob simply because no such machine existed at the time. Several received patents. The dryer increased the value of the grain by getting rid of unwanted moisture. The corn sheller made easy work of separating the kernel from the cob, but there remained two problems. The first was breakage. In one year, $14,000 worth of damage was caused by rocks getting shelled instead of the corn. Bob came up with a device that used sound waves to detect foreign objects in the corn bin. In essence, the stone sleuth could hear a rock and shut off the sheller before causing damage. The other problem caused by separating the kernel from the cob was the question, well, what do you do with all the cobs? This problem, or opportunity, may have been Harold's best example of how you turn a minus into a plus. Well, at first, when we started to shell corn ourselves, there were all kinds of challenges with that. And one was the massive amounts of cobs that were produced and what to do with them. We put them in huge piles, 30, 40, 50 feet deep, and they would, through spontaneous combustion, catch a fire, smoking out mommy. It was just a mess. Um, John, who was our CEO at the time, would get calls in the middle of the night inviting him to come over and try to sleep in somebody's bedroom because it was so full of smoke and so forth. And so, what to do with the cobs? A guy by the name of Joe Vanderhoeven learned somehow of all these cobs we had here and came in and he said he had an approach that would utilize those cobs and help us to make money with them. And then that's how we got into the cob milling business and came up with all those products. Everything from soft blasting to, uh, to carriers for lawn products and uh, bedding for lab animals. So uh, developed an industry, you know, and we're still in that business. The processing of corn cobs, like the 1952 move into retail, turned out to be one of the company's earliest ventures into market diversification. The next was fertilizer. We were selling a lot of bagged fertilizer. We were buying from a company over, I think they were over in Indiana, and we were selling a lot of that to the city folks and a lot to the farmers in bags. It wasn't long before Dick and his co-workers figured out that they could purchase the dry ingredients by bulk 
then mix them up themselves for a fraction of the cost they were paying currently. We built a pole building out in back and we dragged our old concrete mixer in there. It was a one yard concrete mixer that we poured the elevators with and uh, set up some conveying equipment and some bins, scale, batching plant, and began to mix our own fertilizer at a reduced cost. I remember we advertised those just very simple little ads. 52020 price so far they were so far under the market it really it caused a sensation the trucks kept rolling into Maumee requiring the addition of more storage 22 steel tanks were added ready to hold the grain that would soon be going overseas for years there had been talk of deepening the St. Lawrence Seaway so that the Great Lakes could provide passage to ocean vessels carrying commodities like grain, and Harold wanted to be ready if and when that project was ever completed. The Marine Transfer Unit on the Maumee River would need to be expanded if the area were to become a leader in exporting grain. Harold believed that Toledo had the most advantageous position on the Great Lakes. With alert management and the right facility like a riverfront elevator, he would make the route of getting grain from the farmer to the customer even shorter. In 1959, the St. Lawrence Seaway was finally opened for business and Andersons broke ground for an elevator that could adequately load ocean vessels. Harold kept the promise he had made during the big pour and used union labor for its construction. By 1960, it was finished, putting Toledo on the map with the first deep water grain loading facility on the U.S. side of the Great Lakes. By fall of 1961, grain shipments through the port of Toledo topped 1 million tons. In 1964, the river elevator needed to be expanded. Such a construction job required the driving of piles into the marshy riverbed. Harold put out a request for bids on the driving of 1,300 piles, some 60 feet long. The lowest union bid he received was $64 per pile, far too expensive, he thought. So, at a cost of $10 per pile, his son Tom headed up a construction crew of their own choosing. The union representing the pile drivers, dock, pier, and wharf builders began patrolling the building site. Just a few members at first, but the number of picketers grew, preventing anyone from entering the construction site. The situation became so dangerous that extra police were called in for protection. Many of the picketers were arrested and taken off to jail, but that didn't stop the protesters. Union members from other construction sites were called in to join the crowd, which was now close to 5,000. We decided to use a bus to get our workers into that construction project because there were so many people trying to keep us out. And they had a Jeep on the other side that ran into us and just rammed the front end of the bus. And. Uh, the, the bus was much bigger and stronger than the Jeep and just kind of pushed it out of the way and went in and they went to work and the longer they worked the more the uh, agitation grew and dad got a call from the chief of police during the day and I remember I was I was really concerned what the deuce we gonna do with this Harold on the other hand wasn't worried at all dad said look we're gonna get together with a labor management citizens committee and talk this thing over. And I remember seeing Dad walking up and down the hall and he was all excited because we're gonna get this opportunity to sit down and talk and we're gonna compare our way of doing things to their way of doing things. And it'll just be the greatest opportunity you've ever seen. <laughs> he was real, you know. The guy was elated. Due to the risk of serious injury to family and employees, Harold halted construction until a peaceful settlement could be made. We ended up in discussion with uh, Larry Steinberg, who was the top labor leader in this whole area. He was a and my teamster. Da and Dad, he was a teamster, Dad and Tom and I sat down there in days. I mean, it was several days. But you could see the respect that Larry Steinberg had for Dad when Dad got down to the basic thing we're trying to accomplish. And the way we, way we resolved that was we stayed in charge of the job, Tom ran the job, we paid their rates for the for the thing, and uh, we paid our we paid our employees our our wages, and I got extra help from the union hall at Union Scale. I think in the long run, it it uh, 
our experiences like that did us a great deal of good in the community and, and with them. I like to think that we had a measure in, or at least a part, in creating a better, a, a better philosophy in, in, with other organizations. Halfway through the labor negotiations, an ad appeared in the Toledo Blade. On their own, the employees of the Andersons felt it important to express how they felt about their employers and their jobs. Let it be first known that this statement is a purely voluntary and independent action. We enjoy the satisfaction, the which comes only from each having a small but important part in the effort by the Andersons to maintain no principles of against the Andersons. American Rather, we extend to the Andersons' partnership our, all our fellow Americans that we are well satisfied with our working conditions, pay status, and fringe benefits. The security the and dignity of a year-round job. Let it job, be known that we like our jobs and have no desire for affiliation with any labor union. Over 95% of the company's workers signed and paid for this ad. Harold had it framed and hung in his office. He treasured it forever. As the river elevator expanded, so too did the retail division. The first of many garden stores was added in 1961. By 1964, the fertilizer business had grown so much that eight steel tanks were constructed just to hold fertilizer. In early 1968, the Andersons took a major step with its first venture into another state. A 12 million bushel elevator was constructed in Champaign, Illinois. This would be one of the first elevators in the country equipped to load 100 car unit trains destined for the East Coast, the Gulf Coast, and the fast-growing export market. The partnership, which was continually expanding with new third-generation family members, opened its doors for the first time to three longtime employees. Sam Ehrman, Gene Balk, and Ben Padilla were the company's first general partners who were not family members. Then, just after the stroke of midnight on Christmas morning, 1968, Harold Anderson collapsed in his dressing room. Margaret, who was with him, said his death was peaceful. Ten years later, she talked about the quality that made her fall in love with him. I was impressed with his honesty. And he was so extremely honest. If he said anything to you, you knew it was the truth. You could just see it. You could see it in his eyes. Look straight at you. Uh, he's one of the, I would say, the most noble person I've ever been associated with. In the next episode of Grain, management passes on to the next generations, World events force the company to look to other areas for survival, and the Andersons begins trading on the public stock exchange. <laughs>